a warm welcome to everyone from me as well. So today we will uh, talk about Skagen Global and we'll have kind of three things to go through on the agenda. Uh, first, we'll make uh, a few comments about the, the market, uh, some reflections, what's been going on lately. And then we'll go into the fund, look at the, the performance, positioning, holdings, um, some of those uh, uh, other uh, details as well. And then finally, Q&A uh, with anything that you might be wondering about. So then jump right into the market reflections. Here's a graph showing you that the uh, the global market is off to, to a good start uh, so far in, in 2021. You can kind of see the total return figures by currency down in the in the right hand corner, uh, all in, in green so far. Um, but of course, I mean, thinking about this and from our perspective as a long term investor four or five months, I mean, that's not a really long period and it's sometimes worth to take a step back and just sort of look at longer time periods to see what has happened in, in the market as well. So on the following side here, we can show you the 10 year and the 20 year history for for the uh, for the global index MSI world all countries and uh, looking on the left hand side. We have the 10 year history and uh, interesting to note that the total return has been phenomenal um, in pretty much all these currencies shown here, Euro being the, the third line from the top. Um, and kind of looking at it from an annualized perspective, so the return per year, we're kind of looking at low teens or double digits, at least for all of them, um, pretty spectacular in a, in a historical context. But having seen that on the 10 years, also kind of worth maybe looking at the 20 year history, which is not quite as rosy because if you look at the total return, they are in a way in magnitude similar to what you see on the 10 year. So then obviously given that the time period is much longer, the annualized return is clearly lower. Um, just as sort of as a reminder, you know, for a mental reminder that even though we've had 10 very good years, Maybe the following decade will not be quite as strong. Who knows? But um, always sort of good to be prepared for, um, you know, what can sometimes be, um, you know, a little bit kind of lower return figures than what we have been used to over the past few years. Um, now, having said that, if we then kind of move on and kind of see what is the market thinking, debating currently. One thing we sometimes look at and I think might be of interest to the audience as well is the uh, the Bank of America fund survey. Bank of America, they do sort of a fund manager survey. They talk to hundreds of global fund managers to try to compile some type of consensus on a number of different topics. This graph shows you the biggest tail risk that the uh, uh, sort of uh, collective or the average kind of global investor sees. And it looks like currently we have inflation in the May survey that just came out uh, three days ago, uh, being the uh, the largest risk that that manager see. So it's interesting because I mean, it obviously has been mostly about COVID uh, over the past year or so for obvious reasons. But now it seems like that debate is beginning to fade. And as you probably also have picked up from reading the newspapers, watching TV and so forth, that it's all about sort of inflation in the near term. And that has been the next focus area of the market. Uh, and then if we kind of continue, we look at the positioning again. This is the positioning, um, the average of the global fund manager, and it compares the positioning by sector, <clears throat> by currency, by geography to the 10 year kind of history. And then we can see that compared again to the history, managers tend to be or are now overweight commodities, British pound, banks, materials, the UK and so forth. They are underweight things like bonds, US dollars, cash, technology. Um, and this of course also reflects that there is a mindset about inflation and some of the things that we kind of see in the top here, commodities, banks and so forth. They have historically, to some extent, been positively correlated to, to inflation. Not always, uh, but they are at least perceived as being kind of the place to be if there is inflation coming. Um, and we may talk more about inflation later here, but it's you know, one thing that we, of course, we think about as well. 
Um, but also kind of worth highlighting that Skog and Global, you know, we are a bottom up stock picker. Uh, we, of course, understand that every company operates uh, in an environment where inflation and macro variables, political risk and so forth are, are important, but we are not trying to make predictions about macro variables and then letting those type of forecasts decide what we put in the portfolio. Instead, you know, we look at the stocks and then we kind of make sure that we try to make sure to the best of our ability that they are able, that the stocks, the companies, are able to navigate a wide range of macro scenarios because history is also pretty clear that it's very difficult to consistently be right in your projections about uh, macro variables. So with that kind of short intro about the market, what's been going on, let's kind of then move into uh, to the fund in the next section. We'll start with, with performance. Uh, this is a performance chart as of the end of April. Um, kind of see Skagen Global here and then you have uh, 12 months, three years, five years and so forth. Uh, so it's um, the head of index kind of on year to date and on three year. Um, we have been falling back a little bit uh, you know, over the past few weeks or, but as of yesterday the fund was still ahead of index year to date as well as on three years. And of course we look forward and, and we can work hard toward also raising the numbers for the other time periods. They're kind of doing some attribution, looking at what has worked, what hasn't worked as well so far this year. So again, I mean, first comment, very short time period, kind of looking at it on, on four months. Um, but still, I mean, the question comes up. So we have uh, the top three absolute performers uh, being a Google or Alphabet, as it's now known as. Uh, Danish logistics company DSV and the Dutch uh, semiconductor, semiconductor um, equipment maker ASML also being a top performer. On the bottom so far we have market access. I'll talk more about that later. We have Verisk which is a US sort of insurance um, software data provider and we have Autodesk which provides software for uh, designers in a number of industries uh, but big, for example, in the construction industry. And we thought that, I mean, it might be worthwhile to sort of, you know, give a little bit more information about some of these names, um, just to sort of give you a sense of what you own in the portfolio and can you relate to it somehow kind of in the everyday life. And the first thing that stands out that has been uh, causing big headlines in the newspapers for several weeks is that there is a shortage of uh, computer chips or semiconductor chips uh, across the whole world. You've seen supply chain disruptions mainly in the automotive industry, but also in other parts of, of the market. It's been causing a lot of, a lot of uh, headlines. Um, and uh, uh, the good thing here from, from kind of Skagen Global perspective is that we own the company ASML, the Dutch company that I kind of mentioned here which basically has a monopoly position in terms of um, selling the machines, the most advanced machines to make the most high technology chips out there. Um, and the good thing is, I mean, that this is something that is extremely hard to break into for, for a competitor. Uh, and it doesn't really matter for ASML if uh, Samsung, TSMC or Intel or maybe you know, a fourth emerging competitor would be the one producing the chips because I mean they sell to anyone and all of them. You can kind of think of ASML as um, the uh, the store selling the shovels during the gold rush yeah, in the US. So that's kind of what we own here. And, and again, these machines they are extremely complex. Um, the technology is called lithography and basically EUV, which stands for extreme ultraviolet light, which again is kind of a pioneer technology that is needed to make these chips even smaller, even more efficient, and something that we see uh, being kind of a, a good place to be for, for many years forward. The reason being, of course, that you know, if you believe that the technology will continue to essentially 
infiltrate or penetrate you know, all kinds of aspects of your life. I mean, not just you know, the way that we use um, technology more for work, but also apps or you have all your stuff at home being controlled through the, through the cell phone. There's obviously a huge demand for these type of chips and we don't see that ending anytime soon. We like this company. We think that the, the valuation also looks very reasonable when you take sort of a multi-year view, which is what we always do in our investments. So that's kind of one that you can think about when you read about the uh, uh, the, the the memory sort of shortage. Another one, uh, which is uh, relevant for anyone sort of based in the Nordics or driving around in the Nordics in the summer is, and, and not just in the summer, of course, but you tend to see these um, trucks on the road a lot. DSV, the Danish kind of freight forwarder, uh, is sort of a company related to this. And every time you see one of these trucks, then you can kind of think to yourself that this is something that is helping my my pension account, uh, given that DSV is a large position in uh, in Skagen Global. Um, and just maybe a few aspects kind of worth highlighting around the DSV. I mean, though, even though that you know you kind of often see these trucks, actually the the road part of DSV is a pretty small part of the overall business. DSV is more engaged in air freight and sea freight across the whole world. Now they don't typically own, they don't own the planes, they don't own the ships. What they do is that they coordinate between the shipper, so the entity sell, sending the stuff and the receiver kind of receiving the goods, um, which they do by having very efficient sort of technological infrastructure, IT systems, that makes a business model scalable uh, on, on a, in a very sort of efficient manner. Um, and uh, that is something that we like a lot with this company, that they are sort of an asset light operator. Looking at the history of DSV, again, you know, we tend to take a long-term view in Skagen, and it's fascinating that I mean, DSV started here back in 1976. Then it was a sort of a small trucking company in, in Denmark. And then, as you can see on the graph, it has steadily, it's kind of slowly but steadily developed into what is today the third biggest freight forwarder in the whole world. Yeah, so pretty fun. You know, they've done you know, a lot of organic growth and they have made a few select acquisitions on the way. And as you can see from the graph up here, kind of showing you the breakdown of the operating profit or EBIT by division, you will see that. The orange part, which is sea and air freight, make up around three quarters of the total profit. Um, and in terms of geography, half is Europe and then about 25% or so each in the Americas and in, in APAC. So sort of a good example of a, a company which has a global reach, global footprint, uh, growing nicely in the market, extremely well managed. And on the point of being well managed, um, it, it's interesting that, as many of you will know, um, the market tends to be skeptical when it comes to doing MA transactions. Yeah. I mean, especially I mean, the one who's buying someone else, that is usually seen with skepticism from the market. But DSV is probably the exception. Because when we look at our across our entire universe, there are only a few companies when the market actually wants the company and the management team to do M&A, and DSV is one of those few companies. Um, and they most recently did that back a few a few a few weeks ago when they announced the acquisition of Agility, uh, which is sort of a Middle East based company. And this is going to make DSV go from being number five to becoming number three in the global industry when it comes to, to logistics and freight forwarding. And note that they still only have four to five percent market share yeah, in the whole global market. And the top 20 companies, they have less than 40% you know, combined. This means that there's a lot of room for DSV to continue to grow going forward again organically and maybe every once in a while with a well-timed uh, and strategically well-fit acquisition. So 
something that we that we like a lot. Now, the third one that I wanted to highlight uh, was market access, which, as you might recall, was one of the worst performers year to date. So again, short time period, but it has been been weak year to date. And um, uh, what we like about this case is that this is a uh, a pretty kind of fascinating story that we think is going to play out not just over the next year or two, but maybe over the next decade or or more. And what it is is kind of like this. <laughs> like this, uh, this uh, picture shows you it's about moving from doing bond trading, so not equities, but bonds or credit uh, from sort of phones, chat and email to being fully automated using computers, obviously. If we take an analogy and we look at the, uh, the US equity market, yeah, so not bonds, but equities, you can kind of see this graph shows you uh, over time how much of it has been sort of going to an electronification. Yeah? Pretty kind of rapid rise here and today clearly I mean the uh, vast majority of this market is done uh, through automated sort of computerized trades. Not so much you know that someone calls in over a phone to, to buy shares of Microsoft or, or Google. However, if we look at the fixed income market, so the bond and the credit market, the trend is very different or the situation is very different. Actually, you have something like 70% being done voice or maybe also sort of including chat, but not automated. I mean, that's the key part. And why is that? Well, it's because if you think about bonds, each bond has you know, certain attributes that makes it unique. You know, it's about the coupon, the maturity, is it callable, and so forth. Whereas if you take a stock, you know, each stock is each share is basically the same. So for bonds, it is much more difficult to kind of make that trade. And that has also meant that this has been a much uh, more slow market to adopt uh, automation. However, one company that has been kind of driving this automation is market access. The ticker is MKTX. And as you can see on the graph, they have captured around 20% or 19% market share. And they are the dominant player in the market. And as we know from other kind of network businesses, uh, if you are a network, if you can kind of build it out, then you tend to bring in more customers, more clients, and each one who is just added to the network adds benefits to everybody else in the network. So it becomes very kind of a very powerful mechanism, sometimes referred to as a flywheel, if you can get it right. And the market actually, I mean, they've been doing this not only since 2015, but the CEO and the founder, he has been there since the year 2000. Yeah. So they have done a great job building up this strong market position over 20 years. And we think that they can continue to, um, to, 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 to excel in this area. One way to remember this, you know, is, is sort of to think about it as, you know, as market access themselves say that their biggest competitor is the phone. Yeah, I mean, obviously have serious here, but there is, I mean, there's a, a point in that, that, you know, they they just need to make sure that the network that they build, that it brings a lot of value to the client so that people start to go away from analog means of trading, such as phones, such as emails, such as chat functions, to more put it into an automated flow. And we think that is not a matter of if, but a matter of when it's gonna be fully automated. And, uh, and we believe that there could be more than one winner, but we think market access will be one of those winners. So um, with that, also kind of then looking at the portfolio, what has changed uh, or what has not changed, um, this is sort of the summary year to date, so from January until end of April. And you can see that we have uh, we have not bought any new positions. Uh, we still have 30 names in, in, in the, uh, we have 30 names in the fund currently. Uh, we haven't bought any new positions, not because we don't have any good candidates. I mean, we do have a, a very attractive shortlist of potential holdings that could make it into the fund. Um, but it's kind of like a sports team that if you're going to make it onto the team, you need to kick someone else out. 
Yeah, I mean we we don't want to have sort of a name count that starts to drift the very drift very highly and and dilute um, what we have in the fund here. So um, uh, at 30 names, we're we're pretty satisfied with that name count and um, and we have kind of a good diversification in the portfolio uh, and basically very happy with what we own uh, in our kind of long term uh, investment horizon. We have sold a couple of positions. I mean, we kind of sent out or sold the, the last few shares we had of Marshall McLennan, and we also let go of McDonald's uh, as we were sort of trimming and focusing our uh, capital on the names that we thought had the most attractive long term risk reward. That means that the uh, the positioning of the fund, if we compare it to, to index, we have uh, Skagen Global in blue. Index in green, kind of broken down by sector, and uh, and as you know, we are unconstrained. We are benchmark agnostic. We don't try to hedge every sector. You know, we look at the companies that we can find bottom up, and then of course we have some risk management thinking around it. But I mean, the way it turns out on a sector level um, is sort of the outcome of this process. So uh, currently, zero exposure in energy, materials, utilities, and real estate. You also see at the bottom we have very low cash levels. Essentially, we don't have any cash in the fund because you know, we think that uh, we don't think we can time the market. Um, so anytime we give, we're given cash, we invest it to be part of the compounding machine that creates immense value over time if you are invested in the market. Maybe also worth mentioning if you look at the IT sector, information technology, that we have an overweight compared to the index, which looks high. And OK, it is high compared to the index. But um, as we've said before, we don't think that the index classification is necessarily the right one. And, and again, no, we're not going to let the index classification decide what we own or how much of something that we own. Because when we look at the uh, some of the names in the IT sector that are in the fund, they have very, very different characteristics. We own, you know, we own Visa, payments, Google is about advertising, Adobe, um, professionals and kind of creating uh, in terms of, um, you know, different type of, of um, uh, pictures and movies and so forth, and some, some e-commerce, uh, ASML, we talked about that one, and Autodesk, which is a design software used in, in a number of different industries. Um, so again, they don't have you know, all that much in common, even though that they are grouped together in the index in the same sector. So uh, uh, no reason to be overly concerned about you know, a, a, a significant overweight in, in, in IT. Then the top 10 list, as it looked end of April, um, we just wanted to kind of point out as usual that you know, we have, a, as we have talked about before, um, companies that should have a distinct competitive advantage. And one way that that materializes itself is by having high margins and, and ROEs, for example. And we can see you know, the fund compared to the index, big delta in terms of the margin of our companies. We also talked about the importance of having robust, healthy balance sheets. And again, looking at some key metrics like a net debt EBITDA, interest rate coverage, you compare the fund here in blue to the index in green, you'll see that there's a sort of a much stronger balance sheets in the fund compared to what you have in the index. And then in terms of upside for the names, I mean, we, uh, we have sort of a very good upside. This is the upside that we see on a two to three year view. Yeah. Um, so that looks looks to us like a sort of very attractive uh, way, and also of course that's of course why we have these names sort of being in the top ten because I mean they give a very uh, attractive long term risk reward. Also wanted to touch when we speak about the fund just on the um, on the reopening discussion. I mean it's a big debate or, or something that you hear a lot about kind of reopening and who's going to be the winner in reopening and so forth. Um, and to a large extent, we're not trying, I mean, we're not overly worried. You know, we're not thinking about trying to pick 
or come up, you know, who's going to be kind of the short term uh, a winner on a reopening trade basis? Because I mean, that's not part of the long term mandate that we uh, that we pursue. But having said that, we have a number of holdings in the fund that we think would fit that mold very well. And you can kind of see them listed here under the different categories. For example, I mean, if we look at travel, MasterCard and Visa, um, they should be beneficiaries of, of this trend if, it, if we have kind of a reopening up of, of global traveling. The reason being that the type of cross-border payments, so basically when you use your Visa card, your MasterCard in a different country, that is a, a pretty kind of high margin payment stream for the companies. So I mean, they should be benefiting from that. Google will benefit from more spend from the travel companies and actually travel makes up in a way not insignificant part of, of Google's kind of advertising income. Um, so that's sort of some examples from the travel industry. Also hospitals, I mean, they have in many cases been uh, overwhelmed over the past year by the COVID patients and they have put many other uh, procedures, operations on hold. Now with um, COVID beginning to, uh, to, uh, to subside, uh, the hospitals are picking up the backlog in terms of operations. That should be good for both our holdings here, Edwards, which make the kind of artificial heart valves, as well as intuitive surgical, uh, which um, sells and leases uh, a robotic platform used in many type of, of surgeries. Uh, for example, prostate cancer surgeries uh, is one area where they are the kind of basically the main um, method in, in, in many cases. Restaurants and entertainment. Uh, we don't own any, any restaurant in the fund, but we do own Backafrost, the uh, um, uh, salmon producer, salmon farmer on the Ferry Islands, which uh, obviously sells salmon to people going to restaurants. And uh, you know, they can see a bump from this waste management. Uh, they should benefit because I mean, there will be more sport arenas, sport events, at some point more concerts, restaurants opening up, so more trash basically to pick up for them. Uh, so we kind of we look positively on that view. And then lastly, if, and maybe that's a big if, but if there is an infrastructure bill coming or more infrastructure being done in, in the world, uh, we have Autodesk selling software to the um, design software to the construction industry. And of course, Canadian Pacific, very well managed, well placed um, railway in North America. Uh, that we also think has a, has very good prospects when we look over the long term. So we're, you know, we're participating in the reopening trade, um, but again, we're not making any type of kind of big short term tilts uh, just to, to play, play that type of game. Instead, you know, when you look across the portfolio, we have these, you know, these are a number of names, and we think that you know, the key takeaway from this slide is that these are names that should be able, I mean, should be able to perform well in a wide variety of macro environments when you take a longer term view. Yeah, I mean, they're not always going to be uh, shooting the lights out in every type of short term environment, but over the long term, we think that they are well placed to uh, deliver shareholder value and, and, uh, and a very good performance uh, for its uh, shareholder base. Oh, with that, we're kind of done to the uh, the Q and A session, and uh, and I will turn it back to um, to Uli Christian and see if there's anything that has um, cropped up so far. Thank you very much, Knut. And um, indeed, there has been a, there's a, a question, and I would just uh, like to remind you that if you have any questions for Knut, uh, then use this opportunity to uh, ask them. Um, and you use that, you do that by uh, using the uh, Q and A uh, function, the uh, the button with the question mark on it. Now there's a question from Fleming, and he um, uh, noticed that you hold DSV, but not uh, AP Møller Mask, the uh, the another Danish uh, giant. 
Um, what's the uh, reasoning behind that? Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good, it's a good question. And uh, there's nothing preventing us from also owning uh, AP Muller. Um, the reason Elephant that I was sort of uh, alluding to about DSV, what that we like about them a lot is the fact that they don't own a lot of physical assets. Yeah. They tend to be an asset light operator where they um, uh, they don't have to to again get those assets on the balance sheet to grow the business. And why is that important? Well, it's important because it means that the return on capital <coughs> Is more scalable, can be higher, can be better for the for the shareholders. I mean, given that the valuation that you buy into is is uh, is reasonable. Um, so basically, you know, when when DSV does an acquisition, if we go back to like the Agility acquisition that I uh, highlighted here, you know, they were buying Agility down here. <clears throat> they can essentially just sort of take the business, hook them onto their own the DSV infrastructure technology systems. And then they can continue to operate the business with higher volume, but having not that much more expenses. Yeah. So I mean that's the big that's the big beauty of it. If you take someone which is more like AP Muller or someone else who has a uh, you know own ships, own airplanes, own a lot of trucks, then of course if you want to have more more volume, most likely you have to buy another ship, or you have to buy another truck. Uh, and that's an expense that's of course also gonna kind of hold you back and not be as, as efficiently from an, from an economic point of view. Uh, and that's why we think that the uh, the uh, the business model of DSV is just inherently extremely cash generative, scalable uh, in a way that uh, you know AP Muller isn't uh, to the same extent. Doesn't mean that AP Muller couldn't be a good investment if you find it at the right price. And I think it has had a good a good ride, um, but again, over the longer term, we would favor uh, DSV over uh, AP Muller at these levels.